Welcome back, Law Nerd. Today we are talking about the Ben Askren Jake Paul fight, kind of, because we're talking about the lawsuit that came and went almost as fast as the fight did between Triller and H3H3. Now, the fight only lasted for two minutes, the lawsuit lasted for a hot second, and I'm trying to keep this case brief exactly that brief. We're going to break down this entire lawsuit start to finish, and we are going to try to keep it quick. So let's just get into it. Hey there, welcome to The Emily Show. I'm your host, Emily D. Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years. I'm a former prosecutor and I'm a big fan of the cursey words. So let's break it down. First, a note about this lawsuit. This is a copyright lawsuit. I figured it might help to talk a little bit about, you know, WTF is copyright anyway. Just a little basic understanding, hashtag not legal advice. But there's a lot of confusion between what is covered by copyright and what is covered by trademark. So when we have a copyright case, unlike a trademark case, you know, the call in the caterpillar case that's a trademark case. This is a copyright case. Copyright protects original works of authorship where trademark seeks to identify the source of the goods. So you know what you're buying, consumer protection. This protects the creator essentially. And it's for things from literary works and musical works to dramatic works, choreography, pictures, movies, audiovisual works, sound recording, music, things like that. Things that aren't protected by copyright would be things like ideas and procedures and methods and concepts. It has to be tangible. And the copyright is created in the thing when the thing's created in a fixed form. In this case, the fight that aired on pay-per-view is the copyrighted audiovisual work. It is a TV it's a pay-per-view broadcast that is solidified at the time it's aired. You don't have to register to have inherent copyrights in that, though they can also register the copyright for it. In general, you cannot use someone else's copyrighted work without their express permission or you know, things like licensing agreements. You'll see creators talk about getting copyright strikes on YouTube if they've used somebody's work without permission or without authorization. Though there are some exceptions to the rule, one of the exceptions that we're talking about today briefly is fair use. Fair use is a concept that really promotes freedom of expression by permitting an unlicensed use of a copyrighted work in certain circumstances. And there's a factorial breakdown of when that's okay and when that's not okay. But in this context, H3H3 would be arguing that they showed a clip of the fight after the fight aired for news reporting because it was newsworthy in that context. I'm not going to break down all of fair use because again, hashtag not legal advice. But if you're interested in a fair use breakdown, let me know that you're interested in that. Just pop it down in the description box down below and we'll, we'll do a fair use video. We sure will. Getting into the lawsuit, this lawsuit was originally filed on April 23rd, and then the first amended complaint that we're talking about today was filed on April 29th. The first amended complaint just added H3H3 to this lawsuit. As reported by Reuters, Triller said the fines are calculated at $150,000 per instance. So for H3 and other sites who rebroadcast the event to many more, the potential damages are large. We are taking this position because it is outright theft. It is no different than walking into a store and stealing a video game off the shelf. In the case of the offending sites, it's worse because they also then resold it to many people, illegally profiting from work not their own. In that same release, Triller also said that they would offer some kind of fakey clemency to people if they went and signed up and paid on this website and said, yeah, we pirated the fight, but we're going to go ahead and pay. And therefore 
you may offer us some type of protection from seeking further action, but copyright claims aren't just between the company and the people who might have pirated the fight. There are some federal claims there. It all seems very ill-advised. I think it's crazy that they put up a website and are like, hey, come tell us you pirated, pay 50 bucks, and maybe we won't go after you now that you've admitted to doing this and giving us all of your information instead of us having to go track you down and try to actually get you know, some type of subpoena for VPNs and figure out who you are. It just seems wild. And I wonder, and others have speculated, if the reason that they filed this lawsuit against H3 and included them into the First Amendment complaint was to gain the name recognition to get the information out there that, oh, they are suing people. So therefore, you maybe should go to this website, pay them 50 bucks and give them all your information. Not legal advice. I would never do that. I would never be like, yeah, I did this thing that's maybe illegal. Here's my name and information. Here's my 50 bucks. Hopefully you don't use that information to sue me. That seems like a terrible idea. Either way, getting into the beef, if you will. No, this is a where's the beef lawsuit. We can't even get into the beef. There's no beef. This is all burger, no bun. No, wrong analogy. It's all bun, no burger. That's what happens when you try to use Gordon Ramsay analogies and aren't great. <laughs> All bun, no burger. All right. Triller Fight Club 2 LLC versus filmdaily.com, access tv pro.co, online to livestream.us, crackstreamlive.com, sportstoday.club, mysports.club, billasport.com, trendy clips, the YouTube channel, Mike a YouTube channel, your extra Y O U R not Y O U apostrophe R E your extra X slipped gaming. It's little Brandon H three podcast and H three productions. The suit alleges copyright infringement, violation of the federal communications act, violation of the federal communications act under section five thirty three, conversion, breach of contract, conspiracy, Violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, vicarious copyright infringement. Here's the thing. You can't pirate fights. You can't rebroadcast fights. It's like you can't rebroadcast it. We know this. You can't rebroadcast anything. These are not for rebroadcast. Do I think that's what H3 did in this case? No, I don't think they rebroadcast the fight. Did they show clips of the fight in news reporting on the fight? Yes, but... Um, Ethan Klein from H3H3 H3 said that he watched the fight and said that he did not pay for it, but this is not going after him for watching it as a consumer. This is alleging that he conspired with all the other consumers, well, his company, the H3 Podcast and H3H3 H3 Productions, conspired with all these other defendants to bamboozle the viewers and to steal the views and to rebroadcast the thing that this lawsuit is lacking are any facts at all. There are no facts at all. There's a lot of hyperbole. There's a lot of, you know, dollar words. There's a thesaurus that definitely got used, or maybe it was thesaurus.com that got a lot of use. But there's no actual, like, facts. And the thing about a lawsuit is you have to have, at the heart of it, who did the thing that you're saying that they did? when they did the thing, where they did the thing, and what the thing is. You know, who, what, when, where, how. You need those things in a lawsuit. This one doesn't have any of that, but it does have a lot of words. So let's talk about some of those words. I love the nature of the action. The nature of the action section here should also then have facts or there should be a fact section in this complaint. This is a federal complaint filed in the Central District of California. But no, but no, that's not here. Nature of this action. Quote, through this action, Triller seeks in excess of $100 million against defendants and each of them whom are cyber criminals for their outright theft and diversion of upwards of 2 million unique viewers by providing them with illegal and unauthorized viewings of the broadcast of the Jake Paul versus Ben Askren boxing event. I mean, it lasted two minutes. Do we call it an event still? Either way, plaintiff is the copyright owner and publisher of the Triller Fight Club broadcast. The broadcast originated via satellite uplink 
yes, we know, plaintiff institutes this action to obtain remedy for and to permanently hinder the blatant, unlawful infringement and rampant theft of its copyrighted work by defendants. Defendants in each of them have utilized various torrent and streaming websites, such as YouTube and others, to unlawfully upload, distribute, and publicly display without authorization the broadcast to the users of such websites. Yes, they did the thing, and some of them put in PayPal links. Such has resulted in damages suffered by plaintiffs in excess of $100 million. They've repeated it twice now, but we still don't have how they did it. But then they go on to allege that through defendants' egregious conduct, defendants also encouraged other online users to copy, share, download, and distribute the broadcast. Defendants further unlawfully facilitated, participated, and induced others to engage in the unauthorized reproduction, adaptation, distribution, and public display of plaintiffs' copyrighted broadcast, all to line their own pockets with monies that belong to plaintiff. Defendants' plain acts of thievery, misappropriation, and infringement, as further described herein, um, spoiler alert, they're not further described herein anywhere, are tantamount to and no less deplorable than the acts of a pilferer poaching on and looting the fruits of another's hard-earned labor. So they came out swinging with a bunch of words, but it's all blah, 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 no facts, no dates, no times, no who, what, where, when, how. We've got who. We've got kind of aware because it says YouTube and stuff. So sort of, but no when, no when and no where for jurisdiction purposes. Meaning you have to say this plaintiff was in this place doing this action, not uh, somebody on YouTube uploaded a thing. They've sued Mike. They've literally sued Mike. Mike is a defendant. Mike, 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 Mike. Mike, you're on notice. <laughs> You've been sued. Well, not anymore. And then they put in some links to the different sites. They put in links to Mike's YouTube channel. Mike has three things uploaded, including this fight. They haven't copyright struck the channel yet, it seems. So they haven't taken the fight back down. The fight's still up on Mike, 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 Mike's channel. Why do I say it that way? Because the hump day commercial gives me life. And there was a period of time at the DA's office when that running joke was not old ever. Mike, 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 Mike. What day is it, Mike? Hump day. It's a great commercial. It has still stuck in my head. It is years old at this point. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a Geico commercial. Just Google hump day commercial. It's camel. Mike, 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 Mike. What day is it, Mike? Anyway, they go on to say, with regard to H3, H3, and the H3 podcast specifically, that upon information and belief, defendant H3, H3 is a business entity, the exact nature of which is unknown. Literally, you can just search it. You can, if they're a California entity, you can just do a business search and find out. Doing business in the state of California, upon information and belief, H3H3 through Ethan and Hila Klein operates a YouTube channel, and then they put in a link to their YouTube channel for the purposes of permitting, encouraging, facilitating, and inducing the sharing of videos and live programming of audio visual materials between users of the website. I don't think that accurately describes what a YouTube channel is, but okay, bro, go off. These materials include programming owned and or controlled by plaintiff, including the broadcast, which was offered by H3H3 through its illegal uploading and distribution of the broadcast. I think they played like 15 seconds of it on their podcast. So they would just argue this is newsworthiness and fair use. And they played it after the live stream. But notice it doesn't say on this day, at this time, in this video, on this link, they were in California. It says the business operates out of California, maybe, because <laughs> the exact nature of which is unknown. The entire lawsuit reads like that. The rest of the lawsuit alleges that there are violations 
and that it's a hundred million dollars and that things were uploaded and or distributed and that all the different defendants acted together and as agents and or employees and or co-conspirators, but it doesn't actually have facts about what they did. So after filing this, the federal judge was like, um, yeah, what we're not going to do is just improperly file a lawsuit that has no facts. So the court on its own motion, sua sponte, ordered a minute order on April 28th. So the original lawsuit was filed on the 23rd. This minute order, the order to show cause was filed on the 28th. And then the first amended complaint was filed the next day. The first amended complaint didn't address any of the things in the minute order. It just added another defendant. So whenever the court on its own motion is like, bro, no, this isn't going to work for me. You need to pay really close attention, really close attention. Cause the court here is amazing. The honorable Percy Anderson, you sir are fantastic. And to your law clerks, well played because this is patient at first and tells counsel, Hey, um, you done messed up. <laughs> Could you fix it, please? And what counsel said was, yeah, we're not going to go ahead and do that. Please don't dismiss our lawsuit. Guess what? Spoiler alert. The court dismissed all of the defendants except for one, but does it in the most brilliant way. Let's talk a little bit about what the court said in their sua sponte order to show cause. The court writes, that the court has reviewed the complaint filed by plaintiff Triller Inc. against defendants, all of them. Plaintiff alleges that it is the copyright owner and publisher of the broadcast and that defendants unlawfully uploaded, distributed, and publicly displayed without authorization to broadcast to users of websites operated or affiliated with defendants. The complaint asserts claims against defendants for copyright infringement, violation of the Federal Communications Act, violation of the Federal Communications Act, Section 533, conversion, breach of contract, conspiracy, violations of Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and vicarious copyright infringement. But the court then says very quickly, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 20 sub A2 allows for permissive joinder and provides persons may be joined in one action as defendants if A, any right to relief is asserted against them jointly, severally, or in the alternative with respect to or arising out of the same transaction, occurrence, or series of transactions and occurrences. And any question of law or fact common to all defendants will arise in the action. Now, that probably doesn't explain for you what joinder is. And you're like, Emily, seriously, WTF. Joinder is literally joining in all the defendants saying, y'all are responsible for this thing that happened. So you all are vicariously liable or jointly and severally liable. So if one defendant gets a judgment, the other can get a judgment too. So everybody is part of the same transaction, part of the same action. This would be really common in something like a building issue or a, a structural issue where you have all kinds of different people who participated in building a house and you've got a drywaller and you've got somebody who's doing the foundation and the plumbing. And they could be in some cases jointly responsible and it's all arising out of the same thing, building of the house. In this case, I think plaintiff is trying to say that the fight is the thing, but the court is very clearly saying, no, no, the upload is the thing because the fight's not the illegal action that's being alleged. The uploads are, and everybody uploaded it separately because it's all separate channels and all separate websites according to the complaint. So it's not one transaction. Anyway. The court goes on to say that the first prong, the quote, same transaction requirement, refers to similarity in the factual background of the claim. The court goes on to point out that plaintiff alleges, quote, that it is informed and believes in their own alleges that all actions and omissions that serve as a basis for this complaint were undertaken jointly and with the consent, conspiracy, cooperation, and joint participation of all defendants. 
The complaint also alleges that at all times mentioned herein, each defendant was the agent, joint venturer, and or employee of each and every other defendant and is doing the things alleged in the complaint. Each defendant was acting within the course and scope of such agency, joint venture, or employment with the permission and consent of each of the other defendants. The court then says, other than these conclusory allegations, the complaint does not contain any well-pleaded facts that plausibly support even an inference that the defendants acted jointly. The court was like, you you can't say that. You can't prove that. Like, what lawyer wrote that? You, you, you can't allege that they just did it. You can't just say words and have them magically mean what they mean. How do you say that they work together? How are you proving that they're employed by each other? How are you proving that they are agents or joint ventures when it's all these random separate YouTube channels that you've just decided to lump together in this complaint? The court is literally sitting here in this sentence saying, you're going to have to fuck right off with that because there's no facts. There's no well pleaded facts, which is the standard for filing, you know, your federal lawsuit. You need to have facts. This lawsuit is all fuckery and no facts. The court goes on to say, instead, it appears that plaintiff has improperly joined its claims against multiple different alleged infringers who have no apparent connection to one another and who each allegedly infringe plaintiff's intellectual property rights by making the broadcast available on the separate websites controlled by each of the separate defendants. You know what that means? This is Emily interjection. That means that you need separate lawsuits against the separate defendants and the separate websites. The court goes on to say that the complaint does not specifically allege, identify, or explain any plausible relationship between the defendants. For the reason the court orders plaintiff to show cause in writing no later than May 10th. Um, yeah, plaintiff, come to court. You need to explain in writing how this all fits because you did it badly and your complaint sucks, and it doesn't have the well-pleaded facts necessary, and you've misjoined everybody. There's a footnote where the court says, the complaint's allegations concerning the central district is proper venue for this action and in support of the court's exercise of personal jurisdiction over the defendants is similarly based on only legal conclusions rather than well-pleaded facts. So once we get past the joinder issue, we still have a big jurisdiction issue because the court's like, yeah, you haven't shown that this court actually has jurisdiction. You just said a bunch of shit and we're like, see, it means what it says. Nope. That's not how any of this works. That's not how any of this works. You can't just roll into federal court and say things and pretend it's a lawsuit. That's not going to work. And now you're wondering, but Emily, did they respond? Did Triller Fight Club respond to the court's order to show cause before May 10th? Yes. Yes, they did. And let's talk about what they said in that response a little bit. They have a statement of relevant facts. But the relevant facts only talk about the fact that on April 17th, 2021, Triller made a broadcast available. Um, oh, okay. So the fact that the pay-per-view happened is really the only fact stated. The rest of it just restates the previous complaint. Then they state as a relevant fact to prove to the court that these are properly joined parties that on April 23rd, they filed the complaint. What? Oh, oh, and as another fact, they added that on April 28th, the court ordered the OSC, the order to show cause. But it doesn't add any additional facts as to why these defendants are all, you know, acting jointly <laughs> or in connection or in concert or as agents of the others. They start to argue law, but the arguments are just without fact. So they're completely hollow and baseless because their strongest argument is from a case that says, quote, joinder of claims, parties, and remedies is strongly encouraged. Please, please, your honor, please, please don't throw us out for not having facts. See, the court says it's strongly encouraged to do it this way. Nope. Not going to fly. The fact that they even wrote this response blows my mind. If I were Triller and I was looking at having to pay for this, if I was charged more than an hour for this, 
even if I was charged for an hour for this, I would be pissed because it's like, you've just restated what you said above and you didn't do our case any favors and you didn't add any facts. You know why? Because they do not have them. They do not have the facts. They did not do the work that's required to do before you file the lawsuit. There are four lines where they try to add facts that aren't facts, that are just statements, where plaintiff says defendants are properly joined in this action because, one, defendants are jointly and severably liable for Triller's claims under the Copyright Act. How, bro? How? What, how are the, you can't just say that they are and have it be so. Two, Triller's claims against defendants arise from the same transaction, occurrence, or series of transactions or occurrences, i.e., the broadcast. Er, wrong, wrong. The broadcast isn't the cause of action. The re uploading, re airing, or distributing the broadcast is the cause of action. You're the plaintiff. If you can't properly identify the cause of action, we have problems. Like a first year. Civ Pro professor would barf on this. Like they would read it and just be like, Bleh. like it's so wrong. It's wrong. <sighs> Three, there will be many questions of law and fact common to the defendants arising in this action. Really? Are we just supposed to take your word for it? Sure. <laughs> that sounds like a conclusory statement and not a fact. Then, they go on to say, again, the exact same things with no facts and kind of break down. There will be common questions of law. We just don't know what they are yet. Triller can and will. This is their last section. Triller can and will supplement its complaint. Triller is eager to learn and plead additional facts concerning the identities and relationships between defendants. Uh, Your Honor, <laughs> uh, we don't know. We don't know. We're excited to learn together what this lawsuit's about. We just, I mean, we filed a lawsuit in federal court. We have no facts to substantiate it. We think these are the people that we're looking for. We'd really like the court's help in doing our work. So could you please like let us subpoena shit that we probably can't get to yet anyway? Indeed, they go on to say, Triller is concurrently filing an ex-party application seeking leave to seek expedited discovery concerning defendants' true identities. Yeah, we don't know. Triller anticipates using the information learned through its expedited discovery to further support its claims. But there's no facts. So you can't get the court to issue you a subpoena to get information when you have no facts. At present, Triller is aware of certain facts demonstrating defendants' knowledge of other defendants' illegal uploading and distributing of the broadcast. Um, maybe plead them in your complaint? Because if you're aware of certain facts, let's not hide the ball from the court here. Let's tell the court the facts. Tell the man the facts. Because, you know, it's like your legal and ethical obligation when you're filing a, a lawsuit to, like, have facts and also have a reasonable belief that your claim has, like, evidentiary support and stuff. Maybe? No? These are – like, we've learned this from Legally Blonde. Like, in one of the first scenes, on one of the first days of law school, they talk about the fact that a claim – should have like, you know, evidentiary support, but th those are the facts and there's no facts here. So again, um, just watching Legally Blonde might help you write a better complaint than this. I have so many questions how anybody signed their name to this and why they decided to do so. So Triller asked the court to speed up discovery so that they can figure out what their lawsuit is about, who they're suing and how those parties are connected. The court says, Nope. 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 So the court files a minute order on May 6th. It is their response to the response, if you will, regarding the order to show cause. And the court states, quote, the court ordered plaintiff to show cause why one or more of the defendants should not be dropped from this case for improper joinder. In issuing the order to show cause, the court noted that the complaint alleges that plaintiffs, quote, is informed and believes, and thereon alleges that the acts and omissions that serve as the basis for this complaint were undertaken jointly and with consent, 
conspiracy, cooperation, and joint participation of all defendants. The complaint also alleges on information and belief, quote, that at all times mentioned herein, each defendant was the agent, joint venture, and or employee of each and every other defendant, and in doing the things alleged in this complaint, each defendant was acting within the course and scope of such agency, joint venture, and or employment, and with the permission and consent of each other defendants. As the court explained in its order to show cause, other than these conclusory allegations, the complaint and the first amended complaint does not contain any well-pleaded facts that plausibly support even an inference that defendants acted jointly. Per my last email, <laughs> as I've previously stated, as I said before, bitch, didn't you read my order to show cause? I've already said the court is not having any of this, which is hilarious to me. So the court goes on to say, <clears throat> instead, it appears that plaintiff has improperly joined its claims against multiple different alleged infringers who have no apparent connection to one another and who each allegedly infringed plaintiff's intellectual property rights by making the broadcast available on the separate websites controlled by each of these separate defendants. The complaint does not specifically allege, identify, or explain any plausible relationship between the defendants. Plaintiff has filed a response to the court's order to show cause and an ex parte application for expedited discovery. As part of its response, plaintiff requests leave to file a proposed second amended complaint. Plaintiff's ex parte application seeks leave to serve subpoenas on third parties to assist plaintiff in uncovering the true identities and locations of defendants, which plaintiff claims it needs prior to filing a motion for preliminary injunction. Plaintiff additionally contends that the expedited discovery it seeks would assist in responding to the court's order to show cause. In addition to the legal conclusions alleged in the original complaint and the first amended complaint and the proposed second amended complaint, the second amended complaint adds the allegation that, quote, plaintiff is further informed and believes and thereon alleges that certain defendants were aware and informed their subscribers, viewer, and fans of the existence of defendants' illegal uploading and distribution of the broadcast, thereby demonstrating defendants' common enterprise. <laughs> the court goes on to say, nowhere in the plaintiff's response does it provide examples, you know, facts, of how one or more of the unspecified defendants informed viewers of other unspecified defendants' distribution of the broadcast. Instead, as it had previously, plaintiff relies on the barest legal conclusions to support the joinder of multiple separate entities without any well-pleaded factual allegations supporting an inference of any joint action by defendants. That's about as much as, as strongly as a court is going to word something. And the court is just going bite after bite after bite at this saying, I told you how to do it. You've come back with nothing. There are no factual allegations. This is the barest of legal conclusions. Like you've said words that have no meaning because there are no facts. And the court goes on four pages. This is four pages long, which is fantastic. The court goes on to deny both the ex parte application for discovery and then dropping the defendants, but it doesn't miss the opportunity to take a jab at the broadcast itself. And the court goes on on its final page of its ruling to say, quote, plaintiff asserts that it requires the third party discovery to identify the defendants so that it may file an anticipated motion for preliminary injunction. According to plaintiff, a preliminary injunction is necessary to prevent the irreparable harm of defendants continuing to offer the broadcast without authorization. Emily note, Make the copyright strike. YouTube will take it down. But no, they don't want to strike the channels because then it'll be resolved. They wanted to file this lawsuit, I think, for solely the purposes of PR. But you can't file a bullshit lawsuit just for PR purposes. It actually has to have facts behind it. Ugh. The court goes on to say, plaintiff does not, however, explain what irreparable harm it continues to suffer from the availability of copies of a live sporting event 
that occurred weeks ago, the outcome of which is publicly available and lasted less than two minutes. (laughs) The shade. The shade. What harm are you suffering? We know who won. It was a live event. It lasted two minutes. What? It's it's, It's on Twitter. It's so short, it can be a Twitter video. Like what you could make a TikTok of the entire fight, basically. Lord. Plaintiff therefore fails to establish the emergency necessary to support the consideration of plaintiff's request to conduct expedited discovery. For all of the foregoing reasons, the court therefore denies plaintiff's ex party application without prejudice to its being filed as a regularly noticed motion. Get back in line and do it right, the court is saying. The court additionally concludes that defendants are misjoined. Um, Y'all don't go here. You can't bring everybody together. So at the end, the court says, accordingly, the court thus drops all defendants except Film Daily, who's the first named defendant. This order does not limit plaintiff's ability to refile its claims against the remaining defendants in separate actions. It is so ordered. This is the way, is what the court has said. Now, with regard to Film Daily, there's still no well-pled facts here and there's still jurisdiction issues. So it will be interesting to see if Film Daily just files a 12B6 motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim because they'd win, or if they file the jurisdictional motion, but why not just get the whole thing dismissed for failure to state a claim? It will be interesting to see if Triller even tries to sue any of these other defendants. Like, go find Mike, Triller. Who's Mike, Mike, Mike. Go find Mike. Go maybe, maybe just go on the California business website and see if any of these are actually LLCs and then serve them there. I honestly don't think H3H3 ever even got served with this lawsuit before it was over. They just did the thing. They filed it. They filed a press release about it. And then the court was like, no, no. And the court literally yeeted this so fast. This was May 6th. So from April 23rd to May 6th, it was filed. It was amended. Motions were filed. And the court was like, no, we are not. So Triller Inc. is out whatever money they paid their lawyers to create this mess. And uh, they're no better off than they were. If Film Daily gets served and responds, I'm sure they'll just make a motion to dismiss because you have not stated a claim for which relief can be granted because there are no facts. And the court made that very clear in their two orders to show cause, which is why this is going to get up there with Colin the Caterpillar as one of my favorite lawsuits, because the sass from Judge Anderson, the level of I am not having your shit today is amazing. The fact that there was a little dig at the length of the fight was amazing. The fact that the court knows that the fight lasted two minutes, also amazing, because the court or the research attorney, somebody did some information to look at the fight. I, I love all of this. I I mean, I kind of hate it. And here's why I kind of hate it. Uh, this shit makes lawyers look bad. Filing frivolous lawsuits makes lawyers look bad. And filing lawsuits, yes, there are ways that lawsuits can also act as PR. We talked about that in other cases, particularly Nike and Satan Shoes. But Nike had facts and actual claims that they could have pursued in litigation. There's nothing here that can be pursued. There's nothing here that can happen after a motion to dismiss because they've not pled any action. They've not pled any dates, locations, things done. They just said a bunch of shit and were like, see, we have a $100 million lawsuit. No, you don't. You have a waste of everyone's time and your client's money. And it annoys me. But it was worth it for the judge sass. I imagine that this judge, the next time he sees this law firm's name on a filing, is going to go, no, no, nope. Let me take a look at what you actually filed because I don't trust that you've done it right. And once you start losing the court's trust, you're going to gain a reputation if that hasn't been gained already. So I, I am, I am amused and entertained though. This lawsuit is just terrible. It's just terrible. This is, this is (sighs) look, if a lawsuit's filed against you, call an attorney who can break it down for you and explain as I'm sure Ethan Klein's attorney did like, um, look, There's nothing here that they can sue you for. This is going to sort out because look, it absolutely did sort out within a very few weeks here, faster than most things ever sort out. Case brief footnote from the future. On May 10th, after the recording of the case brief, Triller decided to sue H3 again. So the H3 podcast is now being sued by Triller in the same counts as the original lawsuit, 
but without the conspiracy claim. It's written in much the same way. Some of it's directly cut and pasted, and there are no additional facts. I worry that this lawsuit's going to meet the same fate as the other one, but on different grounds. Stay tuned to the channel, and I will keep you updated on the H3 lawsuit round two. And that, that is the, the very brief Triller versus the internet over the abysmal Jake Paul fight lawsuit. But we will see. I'm going to keep an eye on what Film Daily does or if they even get served. Because if Film Daily doesn't get served, then this lawsuit will just be like, well, you failed to serve them. You're failing to pursue the claim and it's gone. And I imagine that that's what will happen. And when it does, I'll share that on social media. So go ahead and follow me at the Emily D Baker. If you are in North America and you want to be kept up to date, whenever I drop a new video or a new podcast episode, go live sua sponte <laughs> of my own motion. When I feel like it, on Instagram, join the text crew at textemily.com. That is a text crew between me and you. It is not a big group text thing. And I let you know when those things are happening and then answer as best I can to the things that you guys send me. No, I don't give legal advice there. So if you're going to text me and be like, hey, I got this question. Nope, sure won't get answered. But everything else I try to get to. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for being a law nerd. I hope that today's episode finds you well, and I will talk to you in the next one.